Item number, SCP-036. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. Once every year, a mobile task force is dispatched from Containment Command 02 and data expunged to Site 22A to defend the runway and airport located there. The civilian facility is to be cleared of all non-SCP personnel by 0400 hours of September 23rd and none are allowed to return until sunrise the next day. On October 1st, all civilians must be evacuated again before sunrise and will not be allowed on to Site 22A until the return of the pilgrimage flight. Pilgrims in transit from the arrival flight awaiting departure on the pilgrim flight may only be cross-examined by researchers with level 3 security level clearance or higher. Description SCP-036 includes the location Site 22A, a small airport in the Mosul region of northern Iraq, and Site 22B, the destination of passengers boarding at Site 22A. The key components of SCP-036 are the arrival flight, a passenger plane that varies in make and model from year to year that arrives shortly before dawn on September 23rd. It appears on radar about 30 to 40 kilometers away from Site 22A. When it lands, pilgrims exit the plane and enter the terminal. No crew have ever left the plane. Observations have only revealed a masked pilot and co-pilot. This plane leaves quickly after pilgrims exit. It does not wait for clearance for takeoff, nor does it identify itself upon approaching for landing. The Pilgrims People of the Yazidi faith that exit the arrival plane, who are said to be undergoing the Kiras Gurahin. Each year, they are examined and identified as various people of the Yazidi faith that have died during the previous year. This is done through birth certificates, photo IDs, specific knowledge questions, and when possible, fingerprinting. Most have been known to be friendly and amicable, though most are reluctant to give details about the Kiras Gurahin. In the past, all have shown to be unable to recognize family and friends, or been able to remember any information beyond what short-term memory would normally allow. In the late afternoon of September 23rd, most pilgrims begin to emphasize how important it is that their pilgrimage must begin. At that time, they file onto the pilgrimage flight plane and depart, never to be seen again. The Pilgrimage Flight A passenger plane provided by SCP personnel for the transport of the pilgrims. It is manned by a crew of trained Yazidi holy men. The crew are typically never able to elaborate upon details of the pilgrimage, or what the Kiras Gurahin actually is. SCP equipment on board function optimally, but recorded data will only slightly increase our understanding of the pilgrimage each year. Though the flight is gone for seven days, the crew and recorded data are only able to account for a few hours. Days are missing from time recording equipment and cameras, though nothing abnormal is ever observed. The plane disappears from radar and visual contact is lost about 50 to 60 kilometers away from Site 22A until it returns about sunrise on October 1st. Site 22B The destination of the pilgrimage plane. It is a small airport consisting of a runway and single building located at coordinates data expunged. It has only ever been observed by pilgrimage crew and cameras on the plane. It does not appear on satellite images and attempts to reach it on foot have failed, once with disastrous results. Cameras have trouble focusing on the area, as the heat from the ground usually causes a mirage-like visual effect on all objects more than a few dozen meters from the plane. A flyover with an SCP reconnaissance plane several weeks before the pilgrimage revealed undeveloped land and what looked like an ancient stone statue. In the 1990s, SCP Mobile Task Force Sigma-4 attempted to reach Site-22B during the time of the pilgrimage. Upon the approach, communication was lost and the task force was never heard from again. No other exploration attempts are advised during the seven-day pilgrimage. Originally, the Kurdish-speaking Yazidi people around Mosul secretly performed the pilgrimage themselves. Pilgrims from the east were escorted by masked armed guards on camel back into the care of Yazidi holy men. It has been explained that the holy men would then take the pilgrims west to their land of the dead, where the pilgrims would wait to be reborn back into the Yazidi people. The Kiras Gurahin, literally Kurdish for changing garments, is used to describe the belief of reincarnation that lesser souls of the Yazidi undergo. 
While this actual pilgrimage was done in secret, a symbolic pilgrimage and Kiras Gurahin are performed every year at this time by other Yazidi. During the 1960s, land acquisition by Kurds and Muslims, attacks by Turks, and punitive laws by the Islamic Iraqi government restricted the movements and customs of the Yazidi. During that time, the Foundation stepped in and offered aid in the way of an advantageous clause that granted SCP planes unrestricted access to airport facilities in the area. Almost immediately, mysterious planes carrying pilgrims from the east began landing at the local airport, and an elusive airport at the destination appeared as well. Item Number SCP-052 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Although it is not possible to remove SCP-052 from the New York subway system, its predictable behavior allows the Foundation to prevent the public from encountering it. The 59th Street A, B, C, D station is to be closed to the public from 11pm to 1am, on Saturdays and Sundays, under the pretext of track maintenance. During that time, the station is to be staffed with agents from Mobile Task Force Gamma-6. Agents have been ordered to prevent accidental public access to the station, and to capture anyone seen leaving SCP-052. Anyone who has been on SCP-052 must be transported to Site-21 for debriefing and processing. Members of the public who see SCP-052 may be released after the administration of a Class B amnestic. Description: SCP-052 is a Type R4 New York City subway train. Official records indicate this train was built in 1932 and decommissioned for scrap in 1975. Nevertheless, it continues to appear on the Uptown AD track at the 59th Street and 8th Avenue station at 11.57 p.m. every Saturday. The train is in perfect condition and labeled as an A-train. SCP-052 appears at the designated time, opens its doors to accept and discharge passengers for approximately five minutes, then closes its doors and disappears. It does not appear to ever contain passengers, except for those leaving the train during its appearance. The majority of subjects that have boarded SCP-052 have not been recovered. Passengers leaving SCP-052 claim to have boarded on various dates, from 1976 up to 2204. The latter claims he thought SCP-052 was a 300th anniversary special train. Subjects retain no knowledge of time on board. Addendum: Passengers leaving SCP-052 must be brought to Site-21 and interrogated to determine their origin and possible threat to the current time stream. Generally, passengers from the past may be given Class A amnestics and reintegrated into society. Passengers from the future must be held indefinitely. Site 21 currently holds 26 recovered passengers. Despite our protocols to prevent public access, we are still receiving subjects from the future. Although some are from alternate timelines, it is possible SCP-052 will begin to appear at another time and place requiring expanded containment. The Foundation has placed several subjects onto the train in an attempt to understand its activities when not visible. Test 052-1 May 31, 2009 Agent placed on train. Not recovered as of present date. Test 052-2 June 6, 2009 Agent enters train. Not recovered, as he apparently returned to 1980 and was killed in a confrontation with Test 052-3 See notes on recovered passenger 052-4 After Test 052-3, O5 Command issued orders that no further agents should be risked as passengers on SCP-052. Consideration has been given to using Class D personnel in their place, but the risk of releasing them into the past is too great. Log of recovered passengers in Foundation custody Passenger 052-1 Entered train July 14th, 2012 Recovered March 8th, 2008 Notes An accountant, on the way home from the theater when she entered the train, 052-1 has expressed surprise and dismay to have traveled back in time four years, but appears to be otherwise unchanged and unharmed. She has been determined to currently exist in this timeline, and must be held indefinitely to prevent unwanted temporal effects. Passenger 052-2 Entered train June 12, 1976 Recovered March 15, 2008 Notes Subject entered train when lost on the way to Studio 54. 
Although unharmed and not a temporal threat, 052-2 is being held as the examining psychiatrist believes 32 years is too long a period over which to facilitate successful reintegration. Passenger 052-3 Entered train December 6, 2014 Recovered June 20, 2009 Notes A tourist from Jacksonville, Florida. Subject 052-3 now speaks Albanian instead of English. Held due to O5 orders regarding subjects from the future as well as possible reintegration difficulties. Passenger 052-4 Entered train June 13, 2009 Recovered June 27, 2009 Notes Agent from test 052-3 Agent returned with his hand surgically removed and a note in his pocket with the message Send no more Subject does not remember his experience on the train but when subjected to hypnosis Revealed Data expunged. Passenger 052-5. Agent entered train at unknown future date in violation of protocol. On July 11, 2009, body of subject was violently thrown from the train, landing 10 meters away. On examination, subject was found to have been data expunged. Whether security should be increased to prevent subject from entering SCP-052 is under consideration. Passenger 052-6. Claims to be a Level 4 supervisor from the SCP Federation, who entered the train in December 2124. Subject had been administered a Class A Prime Amnestic prior to boarding, in a successful attempt to avoid the fate of passengers 052-4 and 052-5. Recovered February 6, 2010. As he will never be released from Foundation custody, O5 Command has approved sharing otherwise classified information about other artifacts in our possession in hopes of gaining new methods of containment and becoming aware of future security breaches. Agent has been cooperative and claims that it is good we do not know how to open SCP-699. Subject turned visibly pale and refused to discuss this item further. To be a survivor of the Great Zombie Plague of 2092 caused by an SCP-008 containment breach. That SCP can be killed by data expunged Permission to try this has been denied by O5. That he worked for Dr. Jack Bright. Item number SCP-119. Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-119 is to remain open and unplugged at all times except during testing. The door to the room in which SCP-119 resides is to be locked for all periods except during experimentation with the entry codes given only to authorized research and security personnel. An industrial-grade disinfectant will be available nearby at all times, and the inside of SCP-119 is to be heavily disinfected before any testing. The contents of SCP-119 are to be monitored through the viewing window on SCP-119 at all times during testing, and will be stopped immediately should the contents become hostile or otherwise damaging to SCP-119. Description. SCP-119 is a Panasonic microwave oven. It was initially discovered by an agent who had bought it from a liquidation sale of the assets from Valley Vineyards. It is believed that Valley Vineyards was using the anomalous properties of SCP-119 to rapidly age its products and create expensive vintages. Records show that said company was making under-the-table sales of vintages dated as far back as 19 many years before the company's inception in 2005. These sales are what led to the lawsuits accusing the company of falsifying product information and other forms of fraud, which eventually caused Valley Vineyards to declare bankruptcy. SCP-119 appears to be a standard model of microwave in all respects, except that the magnetron unit does not produce microwave radiation. Instead, the magnetron emits a previously unknown type of radiation that accelerates time. The amount of time accelerated is based on the time input given at the start and the power level setting. The time input allows for three digits, and there are five power level settings. On power level one, the number of seconds input equals the number of seconds experienced within the microwave. Therefore, an input of 30 seconds would cause the microwave to run for 30 seconds, at the end of which the object will have aged 30 seconds. Each subsequent power level 1 past 1 causes an exponential increase in the acceleration of time. 
At power level 2 with an input of 30 seconds, the microwave will run for 30 seconds, and the contents will have aged 900 seconds, 15 minutes, or 30 times 30 seconds. At power level 5, with an input of 999 seconds, the microwave will run for 999 seconds, and the contents will have aged 31,529,964 years. Experimentation with the other buttons on the microwave have not resulted in any anomalous properties, although they do still function as would be expected from a normal microwave. The Minute Plus button, for example, adds 60 seconds, and the defrost function prompts the user to open the door and flip the contents periodically. Pressing the Minute Plus button during operation, however, does not recalculate the adjusted time acceleration, merely causing the contents to age at the pre-calculated rate for another 60 seconds. For example, power level 2 for 30 seconds would age for 900 seconds, 15 minutes. Input of Minute Plus would result in the microwave running for 90 seconds, and aging the contents 2,700 seconds, 45 minutes, or 3 times 30 times 30, instead of aging the contents for 8,100 seconds, 135 minutes, or 90 times 90. SCP-119 can be dismantled, and replacement parts can be substituted for every component except the magnetron. When placing the magnetron in any other microwave, including duplicates of the same model, the magnetron continues to exhibit time acceleration. However, replicating the effects of anything above power level 2 have failed, in every model, except the original microwave in which the magnetron was found. Although SCP-119, like all standard microwave models, will normally only function when the door is closed. During deconstruction, it was determined that disabling the closing mechanism allows the device to work while open. Subsequent testing determined that the radiation emitted from SCP-119 has a fallout pattern very similar to the microwave radiation it replaced. However, further experiments operating SCP-119 while open now require the approval of a clearance level 4 personnel. Addendum after subsequent testing, it has been determined that the accelerated time experienced within SCP-119 is not accelerated from the perspective of those being affected, instead causing the occupants to perceive that they are simply staying inside of the microwave for the adjusted duration. Should living creatures be exposed to SCP-119 for extended durations, they could quite quickly die of starvation, as they will require as much sleep and food as they would outside of SCP-119. Therefore, further experimentation with living beings now requires the approval of a clearance level 4 personnel. Furthermore, due to the possibility of microorganisms undergoing accelerated evolution within SCP-119, industrial-grade disinfectant has now been added to the containment procedure for SCP-119. Test Log for SCP-119 Contents Cup of lukewarm coffee Time input 60 seconds Power Level 1. Test Results Agent attempted to reheat his coffee. Microwave activated and ran for one minute. Coffee was still cool upon removal. Contents Cup of lukewarm coffee Time Input 60 seconds Power Level 4. Test Results Agent increased power level, assuming the first setting was too weak. Microwave activated and ran for one minute. Upon opening the door, Agent discovered his coffee had grown a thick layer of mold and scum, consistent with the amount that would be expected from leaving a cup of coffee out for five months. At this point, the agent brought the microwave to the attention of the Foundation. Contents Stopwatch Time input 30 seconds Power level 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 Test Results Series of tests conducted to determine effects of various power levels on time fluctuation. Resulting time on stopwatch was 30 seconds, 15 minutes, 7 hours and 30 minutes, and 99 hours, 99 minutes, and 99 seconds. There was no result for the last test, as the battery had died. Subsequent tests using a more powerful stopwatch with a larger display resulted in 9 days, 9 hours, and 281 days and 6 hours for the last two settings. Contents Rattus Norvegicus, Common Lab Rat Time Input 60 Power Level 4 Test Results Testing had expected the subject to age 5 months. Upon starting the timer, 
subject became a blur, barely visible in its rapid movement around the container. At three seconds, subject ceased all movement. At five seconds, subject began rotting rapidly. Testing was halted at ten seconds, and SCP-119 is cleaned of excrement and remains of subject. Cause of death was determined to be dehydration. Contents Rattus norvegicus, common lab rat, small cage with lining, external automatic food and water dispenser, filled with five months of food and water, attached to tubes routed through air vent. Time input 60. Power level 4. Test results Upon starting the timer, subject became a blur rapidly moving throughout its cage. Both the food and water supplies drained from their containers rapidly. At 60 seconds, subject was found to be dirty due to its uncleaned cage, but otherwise fine. SCP-119 cleaned. Examination revealed subject to be in poor health due to its living conditions in the uncleaned cage, but with no abnormalities. Contents: 1 liter of water in a shallow glass bowl. Temperature in room containing SCP-119 lowered to 1 degree Celsius. Time input 600. Power level 5. Test results. Time inside SCP-119 intended to be approximately 24.7 years, with an initial input of 60 seconds. Test intended to determine the difference of atmosphere and heat transfer between the inside and outside of SCP-119, as demonstrated by the evaporation of water at near freezing temperatures. The research assistant entering the time added an extra zero, which would bring the total time up to 2,465,753 years, or over 4,000 years a second. Upon pressing start, an immense amount of air began to cycle through the vent. The assistant immediately recognized his mistake and opened the door to stop the timer, at which point a wave of bluish spores emitted from SCP-119 and onto the assistant. The assistant began to choke and quickly asphyxiated. Subsequent testing on atmospheric conditions revealed low oxygen and high carbon dioxide levels, as well as elevated levels of sulfur. The spores were found to be an unknown xerophilic species of mold. Within SCP-119 was a dense ecosystem of molds and tardigrades, water bears, along with numerous other unknown species, some of which do not neatly fit within existing categories. The entire ecosystem has created a balanced atmosphere and seems to have stemmed from the original contents of the water, air, and the assistant. In light of this test, containment procedures have been updated to include industrial disinfectant. Contents None. Door is removed from microwave for the duration of this experiment. SCP-119 placed in the middle of a large Faraday cage room with freshly painted floor using paint that changes colors as it dries. Time input, 30. Power level, 3. Test results. SCP-119 remotely activated, and all testing observed remotely. Resultant paint pattern demonstrated the fall off of radiation from the microwave. The paint closest to the front of the door demonstrating 8 hours of drying, and the furthest section of the floor behind the microwave demonstrated closer to 2 hours of drying. Contents, none. Door is removed from microwave for duration of this experiment. SCP-119 is placed in the middle of a large Faraday cage room with dried paint. Lightweight floating debris and dust is released into the room through a vent. Time input, 30. Power level, 3. Test results. SCP-119 is remotely activated, and all testing observed remotely. A pattern of complex air currents reflecting the pattern left by the paint emerges as individual particles float between stronger and weaker radiation. The radiation did not actually apply any force to the particles, but rather affected their momentum in relation to each other, eventually evolving into a detectable air current pattern. Contents SCP-442 Time input 90 Power level 5 Test results SCP-442 continued to keep the correct time during the entire duration showing 1 minute and 30 seconds of time passing over the course of the experiment. Contents SCP-289 Time input 90 Power level 5 Test results None Permission to carry out experiment denied Not funny 
Do we really need to explain why that is a bad idea? You already know exactly what that would do. 05 Contents Bottle of Macallan 12 Year Scotch Time Input 60 Power Level 5 Test Results During previous tests, researchers have been joking that they should nuke themselves a drink, and one researcher retrieved a bottle of Macallan from his quarters. The 12 year vintage is relatively inexpensive to obtain, but the 25 and 30 year vintages are considered by some to be the best of all scotch commercially available. Upon completion of test, bottle was effectively a 37 year vintage. Intention of test had been to consume during subsequent tests, but at this point the intent had been heard by a superior, who allowed the researchers to keep the bottle as long as they waited until off duty to consume it. Subsequent testing determined that the results of this experiment were delicious. Dr. Grant It would seem Dr. Grant is a rather poor whiskey connoisseur, as whiskey does not age outside of the barrel. Your delicious experiment resulted in a 37-year-old bottle of 12-year aged scotch. Well done. Dr. Darrell I stand by my initial assessment. Delicious. Dr. Grant Item Number SCP-130 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-130 is to be staffed by 12 D-Class, 6 Security Agents, Level 2-130, and 1 Researcher, Level 3-130, twice per day, starting at one half hour before local sunrise and sunset. All staff are to be appropriately uniformed. When not staffed, two security agents will remain in the lobby, and two additional agents will patrol within the building. Agents are advised not to prevent people from entering the lobby, but to notify MTF Alpha 4, Pony Express, to intercept anyone who receives mail or a package. Twice per day, bundles, SCP-132, will appear in the mailroom. The parcels within the bundles are to be sorted by uniformed staff into appropriate bags and placed in a designated vehicle for transport to site. Should mail arrive with the following addresses, follow Procedure Franklin 16, detailed in Addendum 132. Otherwise, mail will be checked under standard practices for any items of interest. Objects are not to be placed for outgoing mail unless certified orders are given by O5. Procedure Franklin 17 outlines the protocol used in these cases. Should anyone else enter SCP-130 to use the outgoing mail slot, they are to be permitted to do so, then intercepted by MTF Alpha 4 as soon as possible for questioning. The incident is to be reviewed through security tapes, and the outgoing mail watched for subsequent bundles and checked through the list of previous parcels received. Description SCP-130 is a post office in an undisclosed location in South Africa, constructed in 18... SCP-130 had been closed and left abandoned for a number of years. The building is in excellent condition for its age, and maintains itself without human intervention, including moderate structural repairs. SCP-130 has been designated a historic site through an agreement with the South African government. Five times per week at local sunrise and sunset, several bags and boxes will appear in the mailroom. The bundles, designated SCP-132, will show only on weekdays, with the exception of current postal holidays. Bundles are to be handled as per special containment procedures as above. Inside of the lobby, along with the post office boxes, is a slot labeled for outgoing mail. The slot is able to accept packages up to 40 centimeters wide and 6 centimeters high, with no apparent limit for length. Once inserted into the slot, packages disappear, and will eventually turn up in the outgoing mail bundles, if they have not done so previously. Addendum 131 SCP-130 came to the attention of the Foundation in 19... when packages and letters began to be circulated bearing the postmark for the site. The parcels appeared in post offices throughout the world, with correct postage for delivery either locally or internationally, depending on the parcel. The parcels were often undeliverable, either to non-existent addresses, or to recipients who were not at the address, and so ended up in dead letter offices. Various Foundation assets noted the odd postmark, and Mobile Task Force Alpha 4 mobilized to investigate. MTF Alpha 4 arrived in where they discovered the town had mostly been abandoned decades ago. The post office appeared to be in excellent condition, 
not only well-maintained, but clean. While MTF Alpha Force searched, bundles of mail appeared in the mailroom. Agents searched the bundles and discovered a variety of letters, parcels, and packages, all with that day's date and the postmark for that post office. A Foundation agent attempted to open one of the parcels, which resulted in the agent vanishing from sight. Six days later, a package appeared in Sight's mailroom. Inside of it was said agent, and an envelope with a receipt for postage due. The agent had returned to sender and postage due tattooed on their back and was in a comatose state. Agent remained in that state until the envelope was delivered to SCP-130's outgoing mail slot, whereupon the agent returned to consciousness with no recollection from the time of disappearance. Similar results also occurred when agents tried to take away or damage either the parcels or the post office itself. Further investigation led to the current containment procedures, where D-Class personnel sort through the mail when it appears. Once processed and put in a marked vehicle, the mail can then leave the area unmolested. If the bundles are untouched, however, the bundles will vanish and later appear in the postal systems of the world in order to be delivered. Addendum 132 through examination of the mail parcels over the past several years, research has shown certain trends. Over 1% of the mail is of a mundane nature, except for the matter of the postmark. Exceptions to this are letters that were apparently unsent, for whatever reason, and temporally displaced letters. The former, while odd, will be destroyed in order to protect the nature of SCP-130. Letters addressed to Foundation sites or personnel are to be sent to site where they will be reviewed. Procedure Franklin 16. When mail is specifically addressed to the mail is to be sealed in a case with active countermeasures and brought to the office of the present level 5-130 supervisor. Mail will then be screened for possible explosive, chemical, biological, mimetic, or any and all threats. After screening, the mail will be opened and assessed. While no new artifacts requiring secure containment have arrived, the possibility cannot be ignored. Mail either addressed to or intercepted by the office is often temporally sensitive, and as such, impact must be minimized to limit changes. The possibility of the information being used to alter present-day events detrimentally must also be weighed. Using the information given by SCP-130 to alter events requires a two-thirds supermajority vote by the overseers. Examples of intercepted messages are stored within Document 131, Mail with the following code phrase are to be immediately delivered after screening, without being read by 5-130. After so doing, that code phrase is to be invalidated, and the next one brought in line. Procedure Franklin 17. All outgoing mail is to be sent with appropriate current postage at the time of sending, and must be marked with a suitable code phrase. The mail sent by this method is to be logged, then cross-checked with past parcels, to ensure temporal integrity. Upon attempt at mailing, should a receipt appear for postage due, the amount shall be placed in an envelope and put in the outgoing mail slot. The slot will accept the following currencies, rands, euros, and The use of counterfeit currencies will result in a lethal reaction by SCP-130, and an additional fine will be levied until mail can be sent again. Addendum 133, Incident 136, on a package arrived with the address for a post office box at the site. Dr. the researcher assigned to SCP-130, placed the parcel into the POB and waited. Several minutes later, an unknown person walked into the lobby. The subject appeared to be briefly puzzled and walked over to the box. The locked box opened at his touch, and he expressed surprise at seeing the parcel with his name on it. MTF Alpha 4, being on site, was dispatched to investigate once the subject was out of sight of SCP-130 and subsequently interviewed. The subject had no plans to visit that day, but had felt an unexplained desire to go there while driving nearby to visit family in the area. Upon opening the package, data expunged. A Class A amnestic was administered to the subject and was released after memory insertion. Document 131 Executive Summary of Instances SCP-132 To this date, there have been several instances of SCP-132 that fall under Procedure Franklin-16, and with certain exceptions, 
all have been reviewed by this office. Below are brief summaries of sampled parcels addressed to persons of note, both within and outside of the Foundation. Dr. M. E. 5-130 Addressee Dr. Alto Clef Summary To this date, Dr. Clef has had several parcels addressed to him, in a variety of fashions, up to using valid code phrases per Procedure Franklin 16. In each and every case, these parcels have contained a wide variety of means to assassinate the good doctor, tied with either gloating, terse judgments, or even apologies. Notes After many deaths and dollars worth of damage to Foundation material, all missives addressed to Dr. Clef are to be thoroughly scanned and opened by remote under Hazmat 3 conditions. Due to the incident on only D-Class personnel should handle the mail and be within 50 meters until disposed of. Addressee, Dr. Agatha Wrights. Summary, Dr. Wrights has had a variety of greeting cards sent to her, denoting such things as birthdays, anniversaries, and holidays such as Mother's Day from undisclosed recipients. Notes, due to all such parcels are to be incinerated, and under no circumstances are they to be mentioned to Dr. Wrights. Addressee, Dr. King. Summary. Each Arbor Day for the past several years, a variety of Apple-based products have been mailed to Dr. King, including seeds, cider, and brandy. Every September 26th, a biography of John Chapman, aka Johnny Appleseed, has appeared. Notes: Christ, what did this guy do to SCP-130? I don't even think he's been to South Africa. 5/130. Item number. SCP-176 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-176 is contained on-site under the cover of industrial chemical contamination. Any civilians attempting to enter SCP-176 must be detained. Multiple high-speed cameras are set up within the observation room and linked to continuously running analysis computers. If any deviation is observed in the recorded sequence, all recorded data must be immediately backed up and senior staff notified. Description: SCP-176 is an abandoned chemical factory situated near Data Expunged. The building consists of a factory floor and an observation room on the second floor, separated from the main room by one-way mirrors. There are three entrances to the building. A three-bay loading dock whose doors have been welded shut. A ground floor employee entrance. A second floor observation room entrance, accessible via a metal staircase on the north end of the building. When the main building is entered via the loading dock or employee entrance, no anomalies are observed, merely an empty room in severe disuse and disrepair, with a small amount of metallic debris consistent with a stripped down abandoned factory. The inside staircase leading up to the observation room is missing and inaccessible, and so far, every attempt to enter the observation room via the inside of the factory through the access door or windows has failed. When the observation room is entered via the second floor outside door, a factory observation room consistent in disuse and disrepair to the rest of the building is found. However, when the factory floor is viewed through the observation room windows, the anomalous property of SCP-176 is visible. The view from the observation room window shows a static repeating scene that lasts approximately 11.3 seconds before repeating. Visible through the window is a room of the same dimensions and layout as the factory floor, but painted white and sterilized. Set up in the middle of the room is a huge electronic device of indeterminate function, covering at least 50 square meters and extending approximately two meters in height at its highest point. Five individuals in white clean suits appear to be working on the device. Approximately 5.9 seconds into the scene, the employee entrance door bursts open, and four individuals, wearing black tactical armor with no identifying marks or emblems, enter the room and open fire on the research personnel. At 11.3 seconds, the device in the center of the room emits an intense flash of light and radiation and the scene resets. Analysis of thousands of instances of the scene has shown no variation in the sequence. So far, 
All attempts at interacting with the scene have failed. Any attempts to breach the window or door from within the observation room are met with resistance, inconsistent with the suggested strength of the materials comprising their frames. To date, all attempts that have resulted in successful penetration of the door or window have resulted in the damage being instantly reverted, along with the sequence during the burst of light. Any tools or limbs extended outside of the observation room are cleanly severed and have never been found. Research is ongoing into the nature of the device at the center of SCP-176, as well as the identities of the individuals involved. Addendum 176-1 Further Analysis of Individuals in SCP-176 Analysis has yielded the following information regarding the individuals visible in the scene. Unidentified Researcher Number 1 Male Caucasian, approximately 40 years of age, with brown hair and green eyes. Stands in the southeast corner of the room, reading from a standing monitor. Hit three times in the chest by automatic fire at approximately 8.1 seconds, and appears to be killed instantly. Unidentified researcher number two. Male, Asian, approximately 35 years of age, with black hair and brown eyes. Stands to the left of researcher number one, carries a clipboard with indecipherable writing on a notepad. Hit once in right shoulder at 8 seconds, before dropping to the floor, out of sight behind the device. Unidentified researcher number 3. Female Caucasian, approximately 40 years of age, with brown hair and amber eyes. Sits at a desk in the southwest corner of the room, working at a computer station. Is out of the line of sight when the gunfire begins, and takes cover under the desk appears to be reaching for a weapon of some sort shortly before the end of the sequence. Unidentified researcher number four. Male, Caucasian, approximately 45 years of age, with brown hair and indeterminate eyes. Stands in front of the device to the northeast, with his back to the observation room. Shot twice in the head at 7.2 seconds. Killed instantly. Unidentified researcher number five. Male, indeterminate, Stands in the northwest corner, mostly obscured. Presumably shot at approximately 7.8 seconds and drops down, out of sight. Unidentified assailant number one. Male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed M4A1. Enters first, shoots researcher number four and researcher number five, then moves toward the device. Unidentified assailant number two. Male, indeterminate wielding a suppressed MP5N. Enters second, turns left and shoots researcher number one and researcher number two, then sweeps toward the southeast. Unidentified assailant number three. Male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed MP5N. Enters third, turns right and moves under the observation room. Unidentified assailant number four. Male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed TMP. Stays at the door, covering the others. Item number SCP-185 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-185 is to be kept in a soundproof room, with noise-filtering microphones for monitoring purposes. Standard guard procedures are to be used for this object. Ear protection must be worn by all occupants in the chamber, excluding test subjects. Description: SCP-185 appears to be a Russian R-105M radio used during the Cold War, except that it has a crudely added keypad and LCD screen. The object can receive most radio transmissions, including encrypted signals. Attempts to determine how it can break even the strongest of encryptions have so far been fruitless. SCP-185 has a very long range surpassing even modern radio equipment. It functions as a normal radio, until input is added via the keypad. It seems that if a year is entered into the keypad, the radio will receive transmissions from the specified era, depending on if messages were being broadcast on the set frequency. This function was discovered when, upon entering the random number of 1939, Neville Chamberlain was heard, declaring war on Germany. The possibility of experimenting with dates and times has been noted, and is being researched. 
the possibility of entering future dates is being discussed. It has yet to be decided whether the benefits outweigh the risk of causing a time paradox. On the inside, the radio appears to be unaltered, and the keypad is contained in a box affixed to the side of the radio. Researchers cannot access the keypad, due to the box being made from a metal that is yet to be identified. It cannot be cut, and there are no determinable ways to disassemble it. Addendum Document number 185-1 Incident 1 During a test, the year was set to negative 13.73 billion during the time the universe was suspected to have been created. Sound volumes emitted by the object could not be measured with standard equipment. Survivors further from the incident reported rumbling sounds, similar to recorded radio emissions from the sun. All those within 200 meters of the epicenter died of asphyxiation. Sound waves had ruptured capillaries in the lungs. Autopsy reports indicate that the victims essentially drowned in their own blood. The device failed to operate for some time after the incident, and it was found that the device's internal battery pack had failed. Replacing it restored functionality. It was noted that the LCD screen was still lit, suggesting that the device has no special power aside from the anomalous box. The sound waves have also rendered SCP inoperable, leading to the reclassification of said SCP as neutralized. The radio seems to have received no damage. Structural damages have been reported on site, and a section had to be shut down for repairs. Testing has been postponed until further notice. Dr. Any personnel caught using the object to listen to music on duty will be disciplined. Object Request Mobile Task Force Delta-5 is requesting to use SCP-185 to aid their mission of tracking down objects before our rivals. Task Force believes Iranians have important information and wish to intercept their transmissions. Request accepted. Item Number SCP-187 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-187 is to be attended full-time by medical personnel who are to tranquilize or sedate her as needed. She is to be kept under a full set of medical restraints to prevent her from harming herself. Specifically, she is to wear padded mittens at all times in order to prevent her from attempting to damage her own eyes. If SCP-187 refuses to open her eyes during authorized testing or during site inspections, the use of eyelid speculums is authorized. All statements made by SCP-187 during testing and site inspections are to be recorded and analyzed. SCP-187 is to be prevented from interacting with D-Class personnel who are nearing the end of their cycle. SCP-187 is to be spoon-fed. Mild tranquilizers are to be added to all her meals. Description SCP-187 is a Caucasian female, early to mid-20s, 180 centimeters tall. SCP-187 exhibits a unique form of precognition, whereby she sees everything in two states simultaneously, as they are and as they will be. She does not see minor changes, only changes to what would be considered the norm. For example, in testing, when presented with five D-Class personnel and asked which of them would change their clothes, she couldn't answer, as such a change isn't drastic enough. However, when presented with five D-Class personnel and asked which would be shot, she was able to predict which one every time, as she could see the injury inflicted just by looking at him. SCP-187 cannot foresee future events or changes to items at which she is not currently looking. Rather, she can see the future state of whatever she is looking at. This has led to some unexpected consequences. For example, as part of the usual tests performed on new human or humanoid SCP acquisitions, SCP-187 was given a standardized IQ test. When the results were collated, she was revealed to have an IQ in excess of 300, the limit of the tests. This of course would have made her the most intelligent human being on the planet. However, her intellect did not seem that high based on her initial interviews. The test was repeated four times, and each time, she got the maximum possible score, answering every question correctly. 
When she was interviewed regarding this, she revealed that she did not actually know the answers to any of the questions. Rather, she had seen the tests, with the answers already filled in. When she was given a computerized IQ test, where her input didn't affect the future state of where she entered the answers, a keyboard rather than a pen and paper, her IQ was revealed to be 97, slightly below average. This happens with every written test presented to SCP-187. She can see the answers in advance, based on what she herself is going to fill in, even if the tests are in a foreign language she does not understand. This presents a possible ontological paradox, an injection into the present of information from the future. Where this information, the correct answers, comes from is unknown and possibly unknowable. SCP-187 is suffering from ongoing psychological damage as a result of her anomaly. When, for instance, she is in the company of people who are soon to die, she simultaneously sees both their living, healthy selves and their dead, sometimes decomposing corpses, depending on how far into the future they will die. As a result, pharmacological assistance is required to keep her lucid. Due to the effect that prolonged malnutrition is having on SCP-187's health, and the impact that 187's death would have on the Foundation's medium-term emergency planning, SCP-187 is to be blindfolded during meals. Meal times are to last no longer than 15 minutes, and must take place in a location for which SCP-187 has not predicted any significant changes. Remarks and comments made by SCP-187 which turned out to be prophecies. The Divorce of Dr. SCP-187 Your Ring Doctor, my ring? SCP-187, yes, your wedding ring. Doctor, what about it? SCP-187, you're not wearing it. Doctor, I am. Look, it's right there. SCP-187, you won't be. Dr. Wayne's husband filed for divorce the next day. When she returned for duty, she was no longer wearing her wedding ring. She had been married for 19 years, more than half her life, so wearing the ring was considered normal, and not wearing the ring was enough of an abnormality for SCP-187 to see it. The Deaths of the Following D-Class Personnel D-16124 SCP-187 Why is he so swollen? D-16124 was later exposed to the vacuum of space, after being sent through SCP-120 in order to dial it to the next destination. D-16198 SCP-187 He's cute. Interviewer Who? The man standing outside that cell. SCP-187 Yes. What's his name? Interviewer I don't know. Hey, you there. D-16198 turned to face them, at which point SCP-187 gasped and burst into tears, screaming, He's going to die. Interviewer. He will? How do you know? SCP-187. He's got a massive hole in the left-hand side of his head. D-16198 was later terminated by gunfire while attempting to escape the site. He may have attempted escape due to SCP-187 screaming, implying that she can set so-called self-fulfilling prophecies in motion. D-16206. SCP-187 His legs, his legs, his legs, his legs, his legs, his legs, where are his f***ing legs? D-16206 was killed when SCP escaped from its cell and bit him in half while attempting to flee the site. The attempted escape of SCP While being escorted through site SCP-187 stopped outside SCP cell, staring intently. Dr. Klein what are you looking at? SCP-187 How did it break through such a heavy door? Dr. Klein Excuse me? SCP-187 That door is nearly a foot thick. How did it manage to destroy it? 17 hours later, SCP somehow managed to work free of its restraints and did indeed tear through the door to its cell. However, Dr. Klein had alerted security due to SCP-187's statements, so an armed response team was ready and managed to subdue SCP with gunfire. 
The cost of keeping a full-time medical team on hand to ensure SCP-187's well-being is obviously high. However, the fact that her anomaly allowed the prevention of an escape attempt by SCP-187, a Keter-class subject, shows that she may be useful for more than just pure research. A proposal has been submitted to introduce her to seemingly indestructible SCPs, in the hopes that she will see them as either dead or destroyed and be able to describe the manner of death or destruction. This proposal is pending. The potential temporal logistics needed careful consideration. She would, in effect, be seeing methods of destruction or termination, which would only be possible because she saw them. This has caused concern among several higher members of staff. Details of further experimentation may be found in the following experiment log. Experiment log of Dr. Gears Testing exposure of SCP-187 to other SCP items. Date. Undisclosed. Experiment 01. Exposure to SCP-173. SCP-187 produced a sustained scream for 1 minute, 38 seconds, before losing consciousness and falling to the ground. SCP-187 had to be physically removed and maintained a state of catatonia for 48 hours. SCP-187 regained consciousness, but was unable to remember what she had seen, and remained in mild shock for several days. Experiment 02 Exposure to SCP-139 ARC SCP-187 stated that she saw several bone fragments scattered around, along with data expunged, as yet not identified. SCP-187 became extremely upset, screaming, It can see me! It's out. It can f***ing see me. Several times. It had to be physically restrained and removed. Experiment 03. Exposure to SCP-162. SCP-187 felt no pull from SCP-162 and asked why she was viewing a pile of melted slag. SCP-187 removed from containment without incident. Experiment 04. Exposure to SCP-529. SCP-187 appeared very nervous, asking, Is this a joke? several times. SCP-187 reported that she saw a cat and that it looked somewhat lonely. SCP-187 proceeded to pet SCP-529, moving her hand over where the hindquarters would be, as if stroking the tail. Increased observation of SCP-529 requested. Experiment 05 Exposure to SCP-003 SCP-187 appeared nervous, then said hello to SCP-003. SCP-187 appeared to then engage in conversation with SCP-003. However, no member of staff was able to hear any speech or other auditory emanations from SCP-003. When questioned, SCP-187 responded that SCP-003 was a very nice lady. She seems really smart. Increased security and review of SCP-003 has been requested. Experiment 06 Exposure to SCP-882 SCP-187 entered the containment area and viewed SCP-882. SCP-187 moved back several steps and appeared to be in mild shock. SCP-187 was questioned and responded, Jesus, it's huge. This is amazing. SCP-187 stopped responding to questions and continued to stare at SCP-882 without blinking for three minutes. SCP-187 had to be physically removed from the containment area to continue questioning. SCP-187 appeared dazed and responded, It's so… I mean, it's so complex. It's sick, with all the bones and blood in it, but it looks like the inside of a 50-foot tall clock. It's… kinda pretty. Shortly before SCP-187 was returned to containment, SCP-187 suddenly fell to the ground, screaming and holding her head. After several hours, during which SCP-187 was heavily sedated and unresponsive to questioning, SCP-187 reported grinding, smashing, squealing. It sounded like a train wreck that just went on and on. SCP-187 reported the sound lasted for approximately three hours before fading out of hearing. Increased security around SCP-882 has been requested. Experiment 07 
Exposure to SCP. Data expunged. Experiment 08. Exposure to SCP-015. SCP-187 was exposed to SCP-015 with the help of Team Zeta-9. SCP-187 reported only slight differences in the structure until she opened a door leading outside of SCP-015. SCP-187 reported a hallway of pipes stretching for miles and miles. SCP-187 stated that she was not able to see the other end of the hall, but that it seemed to branch off to the sides, with lots of side hallways. Zeta-9 team members reported no unusual behavior within SCP-015, and that the door opened into open air, with no hallway of any kind visible. Experiment 09 Exposure to SCP-415 SCP-187 begins observation of SCP-415 and immediately appears to be agitated. SCP-187 appears to be feeling physically ill and asks repeatedly to be removed from observation. Questioning reveals that SCP-187 observed an empty, diseased corpse that had partially decomposed. Increased security for SCP-415 advised. Experiment 10 Exposure to SCP-455 SCP-187 is taken to observe SCP-455 from a small Zodiac craft. SCP-187 takes a sharp intake of breath, then shakes her head and attempts to look away. SCP-187 has to be physically manipulated to continue observation of SCP-455. SCP-187 makes several inarticulate noises before screaming several times. SCP-187 observed a huge thing. It was a mass of metal, just floating, like a big island made of rusty bulges. It was like it was sick with tumors. But it was all metal. I could feel it. It's not alive. It never was. But it thinks it is. It's… what the hell was that? Recontinuation of recon team insertion into SCP-455 is under review. Experiment 11 Exposure to SCP-343 SCP-187 enters containment with SCP-343. SCP-187 and SCP-343 appear to converse without incident about general topics for nearly half an hour. SCP-187 stated that SCP-343 appears really nice, if kinda lonely. For a little girl, she's really well-spoken. What is she? Six? Maybe seven? Increased research efforts into SCP-343 are under review. Experiment 12 Exposure to SCP-646 SCP-187 becomes violently ill upon observation of SCP-646. After recovery, SCP-187 stated that she observed giant maggot things. Hundreds of them. With kinda human bodies and faces. They had these tentacle things all stuck into each other. They were all squirming and… God. There was one near the middle. It wasn't soft. It had some kind of shell. And this kind of jelly head. It was… I think it was mating. Enhanced security for SCP-646 advised. Experiment 13 Exposure to SCP-106 SCP-187 observation test aborted after 30 seconds due to escape incident by SCP-106. SCP-187 appeared to observe staff under attack or undergoing intense physical torture and mutilation two minutes before attack or capture. SCP-106 appeared to specifically target staff under observation by SCP-187. SCP-106 appeared to specifically avoid harming SCP-187 on three separate incidents. Under questioning, SCP-187 said, that… that thing wanted an audience. Someone to watch. It likes it. SCP-187 refused to elaborate. Further questioning pending. Item Number SCP-196 Object Class Euclid Slash Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-196 must be kept wholly ignorant of any information regarding the reason for his containment. The subject is to be kept in a two-room cell inside Site-17. 
The cell is to be furnished with whatever SCP-196 requests, as long as the request does not show any obvious likely lethal use, and does not violate any SCP procedure. Subject must cohabit with at least one member of the site's level 2 security personnel, who must be armed exclusively with non-lethal weaponry. Subject is allowed to freely wander the installation if accompanied by at least one member of Site 17 security personnel. Note that all staff below Level 3 have been told he is a safe class object. SCP-196 has agreed to wear a satellite tracking anklet. Subject was told that removal of this anklet would result in his death, but this is not actually the case. SCP-196 displays no extraordinary physical ability. Thus, probability of escape is negligible. Description SCP-196 appears to be a middle-aged male, under 2 meters tall, of African-American descent. He claims to be 47 years old. Subject has black hair and brown eyes. There are no abnormal physical characteristics. Subject displays all basic needs of a normal human being. Subject tested with an IQ of 109 well within normal parameters. Subject's psychological examination indicated that he suffers from institutionalization and Stockholm Syndrome in relation to the Foundation's security staff. SCP-196 demonstrates no Euclid type or other abnormal abilities. Note, I've run the full battery of tests and the exam says the guy is normal. Dr. Addendum 196-1 SCP-196's origin and subsequent Keter classification. SCP-196 appeared inside of Site Date undisclosed. SCP-196 claims he was recruited through standard Class D recruitment procedures for testing of SCP. Subject also claims that his younger self is currently living in another location in. Genetic identification checks confirm that SCP-196 has encountered Foundation security personnel in the past, in an incident at Site-17 in 1960. During that incident, SCP-196 was far older and was killed by SCP security personnel during an attempted break-in at that facility. SCP-196 was, at that time, not known to the Foundation as anything other than a lone human assailant. However, he was found to be carrying SCP and several purely mundane weapons. While a Euclid class event of this nature would normally result in an individual being terminated to prevent any potential for a catastrophic paradox, SCP-196's future self is already dead. This means that if he were permitted to die, a catastrophic paradox could occur, damaging or destroying this continuity. SCP-196 must be kept alive until he decides to and successfully manages to escape of his own accord and somehow travels back to experience his own death while carrying SCP- Note that because of the potential for paradox, SCP-196 must be kept far away from his younger double. Additionally, a covert observation team must be permanently attached to SCP-196's younger self to protect his life. This dedicated security force should otherwise not intervene. Failure to permit the timeline from unfolding naturally could result in damaging or destroying this continuity. For these reasons, SCP-196, despite being otherwise mundane, must be carefully monitored and has been classified as a Euclid slash Keter class object. Item Number SCP-084 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-084 is currently under a full non-interaction order until the full extent of the emission waves has been evaluated. A continuous surveillance watch is to be maintained around the active area of SCP-084, with the primary objective of civilian misdirection and external surveillance. With no major roads, trails, or other travel routes nearby, any civilians encountered approaching SCP-084 are to be deemed suspect and detained for evaluation. Under no circumstances are any Foundation or civilian personnel allowed into the active area of SCP-084, except with express vocal and written permission of no fewer than two members of O5 Command. Sentries are to maintain their posted position with line-of-sight contact checks on fellow sentries, in conjunction with compass and landmark checking. 
All reference points should be well outside the active area of SCP-084. Should any sentry fail to report in via vocal roll call, full recall orders will be issued to all sentries, and containment will be re-evaluated by special response teams. In the event of active area fluctuation, full recall orders are to be assumed by all active sentries, followed by appropriate action. No form of radio, GPS, television, cell phone, video camera, still picture camera, or any other recording or electronic media devices are permitted within 100 meters of the active area around SCP-084. Civilians found with such devices within this area are to have said devices confiscated and destroyed immediately. Any recordings collected, data expunged. Description SCP-084 appears to be a large radio tower, positioned in the center of a large open field, with two small outbuildings. Direct observation and sample collection from SCP-084 is impossible, due to the effect that is emitted around and from SCP-084. SCP-084 appears to emit a form of wave, or radiation, that has a detrimental effect on local space-time reality. The most pronounced aspect of this is the alteration of local space within the active area of SCP-084. Externally, the active area forms a rough dome shape of 200 meters in diameter. SCP-084 appears inside this area at random points, appearing to jump at random times, sometimes even appearing in multiple locations at once inside the active area. Internally, the space appears to be unlimited, with SCP-084 at the center. SCP-084 is impossible to reach due to the emitted effect. Attempts to approach SCP-084 within the active area have returned the observation that SCP-084 retains its relative position on the horizon, even after three months and twelve days of dedicated direct travel, both by vehicle and on foot. Termination tests have proven impossible, as no means of destruction are capable of physically reaching SCP-084, even when entered from outside the active area. Local space will also distort periodically. This will cause relative distances to randomly extend or contract in a flicker, causing buildings or objects to suddenly jump thousands of meters away or rush up to other points, sometimes even causing overlaps. These overlaps have a markedly detrimental effect on living tissue. The town of is assumed to have been situated in or around the original manifestation of the active area. This town is no longer observable from outside the active area, appearing only once inside the active area. The town has maintained the same population, 343 humans, for the duration of its encapsulation. Births appear to be impossible, along with normal aging patterns. Suicide and or homicide appear to be circumvented by the area of effect, with dead subjects flickering and appearing alive and unharmed several seconds after death. There are also reports of events rewinding, causing things like mortal wounds to visibly freeze and close. Subjects appear to exhibit many events of inconsistent space-time, as do most structures. Electronic devices and recording equipment do not function correctly in or around the active area. Subjects report bizarre or unsettling transmissions from video and audio recordings and playback devices. This acts to totally isolate from the outside world, precluding any need for Foundation-enacted containment. It also appears impossible to leave the active area after a random period of time. One subject, found on the grass plain, reported he had been traveling for six years. He was found approximately 400 meters from city limits. Log 084-A4 Record of observed anomalous events relating to SCP-084 Detailed observation made of the grass plain making up the majority of the active area. The plain appears to be made of one 10 meter by 10 meter section of grass, repeated endlessly to make up the plain. Sections appear to be randomly rotated as they are formed, causing sections of grass and small ground variations to line up incorrectly. Few non-human organisms appear to exist within the active area. Those outside the active area avoid it and appear to vanish shortly after entering. Animals observed inside the active area appear normal, but behave strangely. Shuddering movements, sudden shivering, repetitive loops, and other abnormal actions appear to indicate these may not be actual animals. Most animals appear to flicker and vanish after three to four hours. 
Vocal communication is difficult within the active area. Vocal communication appears normal within 5 meters of the speaking subject, with reports of a slightly muffled quality reported commonly. Outside of 5 meters, subjects appear to be speaking from a great distance, with a great deal of echoing. Reports of speech being heard several seconds after the subject has stopped talking, and speech occurring with no subject speaking, are also not uncommon. Detailed observation of the radio tower is impossible, due to the inability to physically reach it, and the effect of the broadcast on most observational equipment. Basic telescope or binocular systems show the tower to be hazy and static fogged, while more advanced equipment is subject to the anomalous broadcast effect. Weather patterns, as well as basic day-night cycles, appear to be totally random. Overhead sky will randomly cycle between day, night, clear, and other weather patterns. Relative sun and cloud position appear random as well, with frequent flickering and blurring between different states. Physical alteration or damage to anything within the active area is impossible. Actions such as digging, demolition, and new constructions will suddenly blur and be reset to their previous unaltered state at random points. Subjects inside a reset structure, such as inside a hole, will become instantly trapped and fused. Humans in the active area around SCP-084 exhibit some of the more striking and easily observed reality distortion effects. These include sudden blurring of limbs or head, appearing to suddenly gyrate at violently high speed for several seconds before ending. Subjects experience no pain and are often unaware of this phenomenon. Looping, typically manifested as the repeating of 8 to 20 seconds of time. Subjects will go through an action, example, exiting a doorway, picking up an article of clothing, then suddenly freeze and flicker, then return to the original starting position of the loop and repeat the action, even if this involves a sudden teleportation of significant distance. Rarely, subjects appear to become caught in a permanent loop. Observation and interrogation of subjects show that basic human needs, such as food, water, and sleep, are no longer required after prolonged exposure to the active area. Some subjects report not having eaten or drank for, they believe, five years. One elderly subject also reports having made 2,110 unsuccessful suicide attempts. Subject will sometimes be able to pass through solid matter without incident. These periods appear to last for random periods of time, and begin and end without warning. Subjects inside solid matter when the period ends will become trapped or fused until the period resumes. One subject reports being trapped below the waist in a wall for two years. Extreme psychological distress is observed after long-term exposure. The transmission's data expunged barrier, which is compromised over long-term exposure. Subjects in advanced reception states typically reset after several months. Recorded transmissions show a slight data expunged cycles overall. Attempting to catalog and record these broadcasts has therefore been remanded to autonomous systems to preclude any additional loss of Foundation personnel. Item Number SCP-112 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-112 is contained within an abandoned amusement park, designated Site Said site is to be staffed with a standard complement of 12 armed guards in designated Amusatastic Land garb to prevent civilian interference. SCP-112's power supply is housed within a standard Foundation prefab building with two high security door locks and a standard staff of six security staff and one operator. Since all other rides in site are intentionally disabled, civilian intervention is low. As the anomalous properties of SCP-112 occur regardless of its condition, only mandatory maintenance work is to be done on SCP-112. This also ensures that local civilians treat SCP-112 and its surroundings as abandoned and ignored. All tests involving SCP-112 must be conducted with a portable toilet nearby, as well as a small table with basic food and drink items. Description. SCP-112 is a steel sit-down roller coaster, formerly known as the Blue Steel Surfer. Built in 19... SCP-112 was marketed as the crown jewel of the amusement park. Initial testing of the ride resulted in extremely negative experiences from testing staff. 
When these reports became public knowledge, the financial repercussions of the failure of the Steel Surfer resulted in the parent company of the amusement park going bankrupt. The property was abandoned and undisturbed until a local gang broke into the park and reactivated the improperly disabled rides, SCP-112 included. When police attempted to arrest the members who were exiting SCP-112 after its inaugural ride, the riders began to attracting local media attention. Suspecting the ride had traits within its mandate, the Foundation purchased the park under the auspices of rebuilding the park as a musatastic land in order to test any potential anomalous properties from the ride. When SCP-112 is started, the ride functions as expected until Point Alpha, its primary drop. When a car reaches Point Alpha, the train vanishes. After three minutes, the estimated time the train would normally take, the train rematerializes at Point Omega, three meters from the coaster's starting point. Human subjects riding SCP-112 have a drastically different experience compared to outside observation. The time frame between Point Alpha and Point Omega is massively extended, with subjective ride times ranging from four minutes to several months. The properties of the ride also vary from person to person. Most subjects report elements on the ride that do not exist on the ride proper, like bat wings, cobra rolls, and inclined loops. Subjects do not have any sense that the rest of the world is alien or otherwise different. Only the ride experience is different. Upon exiting the ride, subjects typically experience feelings of confusion and ill health, depending on the subjective time they spent riding SCP-112. These feelings are based not on any physical maladies, but the subjective experience of dealing with a physical malady for an extended period of time. For example, a subject with a subjective ride time of three days may experience confusion that he had strong feelings of hunger for most of his ride, but at the end of the ride, he was not hungry at all. Addendum A Assorted Experiments Experiment 11234534 Subject D34534 D34534 was sent on SCP-112 at 2.42 p.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 2.43 p.m. Rematerialization at 2.46 p.m. Upon exiting SCP-112, D-34534 quietly asked for aspirin before passing out. Upon revival and medication, D-34534 reported a subjective ride time of 36 minutes, with multiple loops and twists not found on SCP-112's architecture. Experiment 11267564 Subject D-67564 D-67564 was sent on SCP-112 at 1.30 p.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 1.31 p.m. Rematerialization at 1.34 p.m. D-67564 reported a subjective ride time of 4 minutes, which D-67564 reported as enjoyable, with the exception of that part where the car jumps off the track and lands right before the loop. Experiment 1125893 Subject D-5893 D-5893 was sent on SCP-112 at 12.30 p.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 12.31 p.m. Rematerialization at 12.34 p.m. At the end of the ride, D-5893 immediately ran to the table with consumables, wordlessly consuming everything he could grab onto, including the wrappers of previously consumed food objects. D-5893 became violent when Foundation staff attempted to subdue him even going so far as to expunge. Upon capture and interviewing, D-5893 remained confused and disoriented, continuously saying the phrases, no food till the ride is over, let me sleep, let the spinning stop, and 152 lights. The Foundation believes that D-5893's statements imply that his subjective ride time was approximately five months long and during his trip he experienced five months worth of malnutrition and exhaustion, despite no physical proof of these experiences found. Experiment 1127556 Subject D-7556, one standard issue camera facing D-7556. D-7556 was sent on SCP-112 at 11.36 a.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 11.37 a.m. Rematerialization at 11.40 a.m. D-7556 experienced symptoms similar, but muted, to those of D-5893. During the interview, 
D7556 explained that his subjective ride time was one month and six days long. During his trip, he was unable to eat or sleep and suffered major headaches from SCP-112. D7556 reported experiencing every sort of roller coaster element currently in use, and a few believed to be conceptual. Camera footage lasting three minutes shows D7556 sobbing for the duration of the ride, with movement consistent with SCP-112's physical track. Addendum B. Rider Interviews Experiment 112-35784-23512 Post-Ride Interview 1 Subject D-35784 Interviewer Dr. Interview Type Post-Ride Interview Doctor How are you feeling, 35784? D-35784 Rolls eyes I'm fine it was just a roller coaster ride, dude. Maybe you have me confused with the other guy. You know, the one that attacked when the ride was over. Doctor, I will. In time. Describe your experience on SCP-112, please. D-35784. Laughs. What's there to say? Before I was sent to jail, I designed coasters. A couple minutes too long of a ride, you always gotta worry about that. But the twists that thing has are damn good. A few of them I'm pretty sure I mocked up back in the day. It would have been a lot better if the next to me wasn't acting like a damn fool. Doctor. D-23512. What was he doing? D-35784. Sighs. It's what he wasn't doing that pissed me off. He was slouched over so much that his restraints were taut, just facing forward. Think his mouth was open the entire time. If it were possible, I'd say he looked like someone who had been on a crying jag for a few hours. I don't know. When we got that slow point before the banked curve, I tried snapping my fingers in front of him. Idiot just barely turned to face me. And you know what happened afterwards. Doctor. Yes. He punched you. D-35784. Not really a punch, really. Slapped me, shaking me, trying to choke me. I didn't get the impression that he really wanted to kill me, just wanted to get an answer out of me. That's what he said, actually. Shit, like, why didn't you look at me and... Why did you not stop cheering the whole time, in a very hoarse voice? Was in mid-question with another when the guards introduced their rifles to the back of his head. Experiment 112-35784-23512 Post-Ride Interview 2 Subject D-23512 Interviewer Dr. Interview Type Post-Ride Interview Forward this interview was conducted three weeks after riding on SCP-112 with D-35784. D-23512 is not willing to speak verbally since his ride. From time to time he attempts to speak, but shows signs of discomfort and pain in doing so, stating that his throat is too sore to talk. While there are no medical issues with D-23512, his experiences have obviously left him traumatized from his experience on SCP-112. Dr. Rand estimates a full recovery is possible before monthly terminations, and at such time he will be capable of estimating precisely how long his subjective ride time was. This interview was conducted through written communication. Given his fixation on certain traits of the ride, this transcript has been edited for brevity. Doctor. Hello 23512. How are you feeling? D23512. Still hurts. Still dizzy. Loops and loops. Spins, spins, spins. Forever and ever. Doctor, why do you say your throat hurts? D-23512. Screamed. Screamed over and over. Girl wouldn't answer me. She never looked at me. I screamed and screamed till I couldn't scream anymore. Throat got better. Screamed again. Never looked, never noticed. Just kept cheering the hell of ups and downs and downs and ups and side to side and side to side. Doctor, I'm assuming you're talking about the person who went on the ride with you. 35784. D23512. Girl with the big jiggling tits. Cheered and laughed and cheered and laughed. Every spin, every turn, every twist. Even when it got dark, I could hear her laughing and wooing. Couldn't sleep because of her laughing and cheering. Light and day, bright and dark, always screaming and giggling. How could she do that? Doctor. She told me you were just sitting there, staring ahead. She said she tried to get your attention, but you never responded. D-23512 
I waved and shook her. She didn't move, didn't notice, just kept cheering. Tried to tune her out for a few months at a time, but she never, never, never noticed me. Kept cheering, kept screaming, kept laughing at me as I starved and peed myself and slammed my head against the side till I bled. Just kept laughing and screaming through the loops and the spins and the deep, dark dips that never ended, never stopped crushing. Doctor, 23512, I'm trying to help you, but acting insane won't help you in the least. There was no injury to your head at the end of the ride. D23512, I there, I felt it. The warm on my head till it got cold and stopped spilling. Still itches. Doctor, so what happened at the end of the ride? You had a bit of an issue with 35784. D23512, she stopped laughing and giggling after all that time, and she looks at me and smiles and says, Nice ride, eh? And I shook her and tried to ask her why she wouldn't stop laughing and screaming. I didn't want to hurt hurt her. Not really. Just wanted to know why. Why? 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 Repeats several times till 23512 is disabled. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.